Welcome to the Franchise Show. I'm Joe Arrigo. With me is my partner in crime, my brother, and my company's co-founder, TQ. Hey, we in the building, boys and girls. How y'all doing tonight? Man, it's it's a good day. Man, weekend's man. almost here. Ready to yes, go. Indeed, man. Yes, indeed. With the weekend almost here for us, it's college football. You know it. And Thursday night, UNLV takes on San Jose State at Allegiant Stadium at the Death Star or... I don't know we got to figure out a cool name for it for the Rebels. But <laughs> the big slot machine. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a bad looking woman. <laughs> so, uh, man. man, so like we, 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 were, we did something really cool last week on Franchise Sports Media. Go check it out in our media section for UNLV. Um, we interviewed head coach Marcus Arroyo for his first down, uh, first ever one on one sit down interview. He didn't do what anybody else he chose to do with us, which was really dope. So I have a, you know, you know, as well as anybody, like I have a relationship with Coach Arroyo. He's a good guy. Um, he's somebody that I, I consider a friend. But what did you learn in that interview about Arroyo that you didn't already know? Because you see him on the sidelines more. Because I'm in the press box and you're on the sidelines. Yeah. So what did, what did you see the difference between just in general with him? Um, he's a lot more like Vegas than I thought he was. This, what like, do you mean by there's that? A vi- there's a vibe out here. Like, this is a, you know, the, the outside world looks at Las Vegas as one thing, but the people who live here understand it as something else. Um, it's not always just a strip. Like, this is a real blue-collar town. Like, people here get down and dirty. They work hard. They go hard. And there's a competitive nature that comes with him that, you know, you can see it on the sideline, but at, in, in that in that position... That's for the public. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so many guys. It's one thing on the sideline. When you get them in the office, there's something totally different. Um, I think the difference with him is that in the time that he came in, we haven't had the opportunity to meet him yet. You know what I'm saying? Because of COVID, because of everything. And, and a lot of that came out in you guys' interview. If he would have, if we'd have had the opportunity to you know, have more situations like we had the other night to be able to sit down, talk to him, listen to him, listen to his story. Um, I think a lot of people would understand him better. But what 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 happened for me is after listening to you guys' conversation and then just talking to him myself afterwards, I noticed a difference in the team. I noticed a difference in the team between when I first started covering UNLV and now. And that difference definitely comes from him there's a com- there's a, a competitive nature and a will to want to win and win the right way that quite frankly UNLV didn't have to me when I first started shooting from the sidelines like I'm, you didn't I, think I, they were trying to win with, with Tony it's not that they weren't trying to win it's that did they believe they could everybody wants to win but when you get out there and you've lost and lost and lost and lost Sometimes that will breaks. Right. This team's will has not broken. That that old team, I remember when they will broke. And and that happens. It happens on every level. It happens from Pop Warner all the way up to the NFL. Sometimes you know you can't win. This team got into specifically Iowa State. Yeah. It was no way they could win that game. They were completely outmatched all over the field. Them guys was twice as big. I mean, they was just big. Bigger, faster, stronger? All of that. Big Midwest Maulers. And there was no way. Corn fed. Yeah, you know, there's no way UNLV was going to pull that game out. But you wouldn't have thought that from the sideline. You wouldn't have thought that from the sideline. And that is, that is a big difference that I didn't understand until we had a chance to talk to him the other night. So I, I, the way I see it, you can't lose this many games straight as a college football fan and – still be interested in where the team has to go. Nine mm-hmm. times out of ten, you're going to be hurting, you're going to be mad, you're going to be upset, and you ain't going to want to hear it. But see, but in our situation, being close to the program, being able to see 
the changes in practice, being able to see guys holding each other accountable. Um, it, I'm, I'm excited, man. You know, that, it, like that last loss hurt deep in my guts. So I felt that, you know what I'm saying? Bro, I was, I, <laughs> I stood in the parking lot. I, I ended, my night ended when the game ended and a few of us media types went to the media parking lot. Yeah. And the game ended, at, I think, about like seven thirty eight. Mm-hmm. I didn't leave there. I didn't get back to the crib till almost eleven. I was there for two and a half hours. Jeez. And I still came home. Pissed. What was y'all doing? Decompressing, trying to figure it out. Like, like literally, Tony Cardasco. You guys know Tony, friend of the show. He, I was, I have a a Kappa sweater. Right? He said my face was as red as my sweater. <laughs> you see me. You see me angry. See the how I get. I'm, yeah. hi- I'm hyper colored. So, yeah, you was in there hot. Bro, I get it. I feel like, you know, what I learned with Arroyo, I didn't really, what I'm glad he let out publicly, you know, Arroyo's got some hood in him. Yeah, absolutely. Like, he grew up in a broken home. Yeah. He grew up, you know, he's a Puerto Rican and Irish descent. That, that yeah. you know, so you know he's already wound up and ready to go. Nuts. And, <laughs> and he, he didn't have a lot growing up. Right. His mom was a butcher in a town where they have one stoplight and that's for the yeah. kids to go to school, walk across the street. Yeah. It got, watch the interview. He really describes it real well. And he just got a, he, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. I didn't even like think about it like that because people see him from a distance and they think that he's just this arrogant, flashy they just think stylish he's slick. guy. And it's not just that. It's coming from Oregon and all you know, they slick up there and it's just slick. Everything everybody thinks he's slick, but he's not. He's just he's just like one of us, to be honest. He's and just like, into fashion and shoes and Yeah. Uh, and, and and at the time when he came up is the time when we came up. Yeah. So being able to just get that side of him, um, I think he was saying he was saying the other night that I guess it was some function that he had just went to, and it was like the first one that he had been able to yeah, he, go to. He hasn't been able to move around the right, city at because all. of because of COVID and everything. And it's like, man, to be in your second in your second season, and like the city hasn't even been able to meet you yet. I mean, this man has come in under some real. I mean, he got some big some big mountains ahead of him, even when he took this job. And part of y'all interview that that I really liked was why well, well, was that in the interview or when we was talking to him? He was saying how. Um, he took it knowing yes. full well how hard it was going to be. Yeah, that was, was the challenge to him. He wanted to, I, I mean, and, and we talked about it, man. We talked about it when we first started our company. Like, can you imagine if this team starts winning in this city right now? Well, bro, let, I'll even say this to take it a step further. UNLV on Wednesday received a commitment from Bobo Masters, this receiver from uh, Yates High School in Houston. Shh. This is a cat that was committed to Baylor and decommitted because Oregon offered. Mm. And he had Oregon, LSU, Auburn, Baylor, Ole Miss, mm. Mississippi State, Tennessee, Arizona State, like big boys. Crazy. And he chose UNLV. This is an 0-6 team, 0-12 under Coach Arroyo, if you, if you include the COVID year. Right. And you're still getting guys like that. Like, what's yeah. it gonna be like when when they're winning? Like, imagine what this would what how this place is gonna blow up yeah. when they're winning. And and that's one of the things that I think when he said when Coach said in the interview that you know when the job was offered, you know, he talked to some people and they're telling him not to take it, and that made him want to take it even more. Yeah, yeah, I dug that. I did too. I dug that. That's the rebel in him. Yeah, man. And it, and it's it's it's. You know how they say everything's bigger in Texas, but to be honest, like if you do it big in Vegas, it's even bigger. <laughs> it's just, it's just ridiculously big. So it's just they just got to put together a string of wins. Um, you know, Vegas gets behind winners, man. That's what the mentality is of this town. I mean, this is a gambling town. Yeah. It's about winning. So. It's just winning. It's just getting on the field and, and 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 not allowing. It's like you just snatched, <laughs> you just snatched yeah. the loss that you had back. You snatched, you just lost, you snatched. snatched it. You just you had a win and you just took a loss out of it. It's in, just nuts. In the words of Joe Pacheco, you snatched a loss from the jaws of victory. Oh my goodness! Exactly. But uh, I'm gonna put the city on notice though. 
I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to piss somebody off, but I'm just going to say oh, it. Oh, here you go. Do we need to put out an FSM disclaimer? <laughs> don't want to be sued. Um, none of the lawyers in the town, uh, you know, like, I don't need Battleborn or Naki or nobody calling me about what he's about no, no, to no. say right now. What I'm going to say is, what I'm going to say is real simple. In <laughs> order for this program to take the necessary steps forward, it's time for the people who run the properties out here, casinos, that are powerful businessmen and women out here to step up and put their money where their mouth is. You did it when Tark was here, when, when the seventies and eighties, when Tark needed something, he went to the casinos. He had Frank Sinatra recruiting people. He, the city stepped up for him. It's time to do it for the football program. They started it when Tony raised the, the nearly $40 million for the Fertitta football complex. But now it's up to them. Go to coach. What do you need? Do you need, do you need a private jet to go recruit? What are the, what are your what are your players need? Let's help you with the NIL deals because let's make sure they have everything every student athlete and I'm talking about football in particular right now cuz that is the cash cow for any university. What do they need to make sure they don't have any needs? When you when the city invests and steps up like that, that's when this turns into one of the most powerful and dangerous programs in the country. Until that happens, it's going to be a struggle. No matter how well, of, how great of a job Marcus Arroyo does recruiting, no matter how great of a job Tony Sanchez did fundraising, and no matter how great of a job Ron Meyer did in the 70s winning football games, right. you have to have the support of the city behind you. You have to have the powerful people behind you, not just one person. Everybody has to do it. Because guess what, folks? If they do that, now you get better buildings built on campus. Now you enter a big Power Five conference where you make the football program alone or the athletic program alone is bringing $30 million or so in on a TV deal. That changes the whole landscape of the university, not just the athletic department, but it comes down to football. And I believe in talking with the players and talking with recruits and even talking with coaches, what Marcus Arroyo was building inside of that, those walls at the Fertitta Football Complex, is something that's going to be sustainable for a very long time. It's a culture of winning. It's a culture of accountability. And it's a culture of next man up. We period. We got if, if someone goes down, next one has to step up. We we see it with the quarterback position. They they've played four quarterbacks this year. How many colleges in the country have played four quarterbacks? Yeah, yeah. I feel you. It's a mentality, man. It's a mentality, and they, they always say any anytime you um Anytime you, you're trying to go from losing to winning, it's about a culture change. It's about a shift in the culture. But you're right. The city plays a big part. They play a part on, on a lot of levels. Like, you know, it ain't Sam Boyd, y'all, but, like, more people can show up for the game. Yeah. Like, for real. Um, the excuse I'm of getting, Sam Boyd I, being too far is yeah, gone. Yeah, come now. on, man. Come on, man. The stadium is... It's great. I understand, like, there's this whole vibe. Oh, they lose, they lose, they lose, they lose. Listen, it's a good outing. Come out, bring the family, get loud, help the boys out. Um, I'm getting sick of hearing the other team louder than UNLV with more people at the stadium. Y'all got to realize, like, everybody wants to come to this town. Everybody wants to see this stadium. So, like, let's represent. Come on out to the game, please. Fill our side up. Like, we ain't dead yet, everybody. We ain't dead yet, Las Vegas. Well, you, you talk about changing mentality. Let's look at Charles Williams, the running back. I mean, Chuck is 163 yards away from setting the all-time rushing record for UNLV prior yeah. to the San Jose State game. Yeah. And after the loss on Saturday, he said in the, in the, his, the press conference, he was with him and um, Jacoby Winman were speaking with Coach. To the, to the media, and Chuck goes, I just would have given 5% more. 5% more. Now, this is a man that ran for 221 yards and three touchdowns. Out there balling. And he's talking about, I need to get 5% more. And he said it, and he goes, it would have helped Jacoby and the defense out. It would have put them in a position where they didn't, their backs weren't against the wall and they weren't forced to do something. It would have helped my brothers out. And I let my team down. Dude. That's what that's what you want from senior leadership. And he's talking about one play in particular. Isn't It, it was... The play before, uh, the series before Camfrio went down. Yeah. And it was third down and like six or whatnot. And he was running off tackle. And the middle linebacker literally just trips him up. 
barely got him. Chuck would still be running. Oh, yeah. He gone to the races. He and that's to the races. And that'd there. be almost 300 yards rushing in a game for him. Oof. And he's talking about he needs and to get 5% And a win. <laughs> the most, that's the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. And he still feels I got to get 5% more. I mean, yeah. bro, I ain't going to lie. That's what got me. That's what got me hot. That's one of the things that got me hot. I, I, I started to tear up. Like, I'll, I'll say it. I, I wouldn't expect nothing else from Chuck, though. Yeah. That's just how he's built. Um, you know, I I, I want to see him in the league, man. I just hope he get a shot. He just needs to get a shot in the league because with that shot, I think he can hit a home run. Hey, by the way, I was at practice on a was it Monday night. Yeah. The Lions are there watching him. Really? Yeah. Sweet. So the Lions are there watching Chuck. So, I mean, I'm I, nice. I don't care where he goes. Honestly, though, as long as he goes somewhere. Just get him a shot. Get him a chance on the field, and please underestimate him. Yeah, well, I know who I'm underestimating right now. Who's that? The damn Dodgers. Yo, come on, man. We was having a good conversation. Hey. Now you want to take it off a cliff. Hey, bro, I'm so livid with them right now. I mean, they lost 92 Wednesday night to fall three games to one in the NLCS. We're both Dodger fans. Squeeze. I know what the problem is. This is about to be outlandish. We need some kind of, uh, what are we going to do? I need an outline or something. That ain't it. That ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they want to they, no, they hear what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Starting pitching. Kershaw goes down, but they relied so most heavily on Serzer and Urias throughout the year, and Bueller for that matter. Serzer and Urias have dead arms. And dead arms... Don't go away in a day, in a week, in four days. And Bueller just hit the wall right now. He's he's been the stopper for them all year when things are going bad. And really, the last few weeks of the season, he wasn't pitching great. Dodgers have their and and Dave Roberts' refusal to, to have somebody else start besides them and using a starter or whatever the the bullpen to start the game. That's the issue. That not enough starting pitching right now. So the curse on injuries come back to bite him in the ass a little bit, but. The other thing is, where's the hunger and the injuries? You lose Justin Turner now. He's out for the rest of the playoffs with a pulled hammy. Your boy, Max Muncy, down. Kershaw, down. No Dustin May. Dustin May's another one. I mean, you know, um, part of this is attrition. This team has played. Late for years, mm-hmm. late into the season, they probably played another half season more than most teams in the league. Um, the other part is, I just feel like it's too many people with calculators and math problems yes. and stuff, man. Nerds, like ain't like go out there and manage a baseball game. It's like win or go home every night. It's a series, right? Go out there and manage a baseball. Get a game been going on since the 1800s. You throw a ball to try to keep a man from hitting it. If the man hits the ball too many times, you're going to lose. Is that not what it's about? Yeah. All right. So all of the damn math formulas and the analytics and all that, it, I just feel like it just it, bite, it bites the Dodgers in the ass, man. And they got to go back to just, just play baseball at the end of the year. Just play baseball. Andrew Freeman does a great job of, of evaluating talent and, and bringing guys in and, and managing the books. Does a Why is he messing with the game plan? But that's my biggest problem. Before what it was Farhan anxiety. Now, it, now it's him. Look, Dave Roberts can crap out more baseball than most people would ever know. Verb, you know baseball. Please explain this to me. You know it a lot better than I do. Please explain to me because I've never heard of this. Why, why are those people involved with the on the field decisions? Because they they write the checks, and they have they have numbers and they have calculators and computers that tell them if this guy does this in this situation or if you do this in this in that situation, this is the most probable outcome. So we're going to go with the laws of probability versus feel. Why wouldn't those guys be under Dave Roberts as? consultants 
like giving him all the information for him to use in making his decisions. Because they also how have, could they be above him? Because they have business degrees and they run the day to day business operations of the team on the field. That's that's exactly what it is. I mean, look, I, that's ridiculous. Analytics should be a tool, not the rule. Absolutely correct. Period. I Agreed. mean, agree. And you see, and let's use the perfect example: the Oakland days under Billy Bean. How many World Series have they won with Moneyball? Zero. There's been, there's really been, when it comes to, when it comes to, to Moneyball, you have the Red Sox that won two, mm-hmm. and the Cubs, the Dodgers, they won, they won, but I don't know how analytical they were last year because a lot of it was done off feel from Dave Roberts. Right. Why aren't they going back to it in this series against the Braves? I'm gonna say this now, and I hate to say this because. I would love to see them repeat, but Dodgers are done. It's the series is over. The Braves will clinch it tonight at Dodger Stadium. Or that's just what the deal. That's just what it is. Disagree. Dodgers win tonight. They lose the next game in the A in Atlanta. They're gonna go to the Blue Flame afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> Magic City. There it is. With the wings. No, nah, I just I I don't think that they I don't think that they they even make it to Atlanta. Squeeze to be honest with you because. You're starting with your relievers today again. You know you don't have a starting pitcher. Scherzer's going to go again. He's throwing on a dead arm. Urias is done. You've used the other the other night. You used nine relief pitchers, and Bueller start. I mean, he did that. He he does it. They they, they do that. They've won like that. They've not won like tons of series like that. They but didn't have the injuries. Not with the injuries. They didn't have the injuries. You're right. right. You, not when you're a leader, one of your leaders with Turner being out. Now, if I'm if I'm if I'm Doc, I start Pujols at first base today, left-handed pitcher going, and Bellinger's in center. Taylor's at third, and then Pollock's in left. Hmm. And Bellinger's still going to stay hitting down in the lineup because I think it brings balance, and he's getting right. Pujols will be probably in the I would say the five hole, maybe the four hole. This could be his last game. Yeah. And I hope not. I hope he comes back to the Dodgers next year in the same role. Because he adds, Teal adds something to that yeah. team. Um, but then now you're gonna have to now you're gonna have to manage the bullpen. You're gonna have to man I just I just I think the Dodgers is just too much up they have too much up against them right now. Look, man, if Doc is truly great, he's gonna win this game tonight. As simple as that. We shall see. They're up against it right now. That's what it takes to win championships. Sometimes it ain't, it, you know, sometimes you're just up against it. I hope what I'm What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You better go out there and, and hit that ball. Number one issue, stop stranding runners. Yeah. Stop stranding runners. Stop hitting into double plays. Damn the shift. Hit against it. So let me ask you this. We watch a lot of games together. Yeah. What's my biggest complaint about the Dodgers? Offense. What do I? What do you hear? What do you hear me complain about and yell at? Cody Bellinger's, <laughs> not not well, yeah, yelling at bad and average. Well, not just his average, but every single Dodger other than Mookie Betts. I yell at a Seager about it. I yell at I yell at Turner about it. They all try to swing for the fences, man. Just put the ball in play. Real talk, real talk. When you seen Bellinger do it the other day, what did he do? Go. Shorten his swing, shorten his swing, and he went over the fence. Went yeah yeah. So why not do it now? It works for Mookie. And what is Mookie's hitting? Like almost 500 in this series? Yeah. The like same, that. man. It's, it's, it's annoying. We ain't dead yet, man. Dodgers ain't dead yet. I'm not about to believe that. Never underestimate the heart of a champion. We are the champions. Yeah, I'm underestimating them. It's a wrap. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I tell you. I'm being realistic, bro. Like, jinxing. Jinxing the game. Look. Los Angeles last year recreated 88. Did a great job of it. Dodgers winning the World Series. Lakers winning the title too. It's perfect. I don't see the same magic with the Dodgers. That was kind of year before last at this point. If you do realize that, right? You do realize that the Lakers are not the defending NBA champion. Well, there was two champions in the same year. Just about. I mean, they won it like in what? June and the season started in August. Yeah, 
something, something or like July that. or in August or yeah, whatever. something ridiculous like that. It's my point. Like, I mean, damn near the same year. Well, I don't see the same magic with them, but I do see something with the Lakers. Mm-hmm. I do. You see I, something after one game? It's one game, of man. I see one game, man. It doesn't matter. You can still pick things up after one game. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, but you get so excited and emotional about things, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes you just got to chill out and let it ride. You know what I'm saying? These some old vets. Don't go to getting all stressed out, Joseph. Look it. Terencio, let me ask you a question. I'm going to be fine, man. What you see with AD, man? Is, is, is AD to you the same guy he was in, in 2019 or 2020, or is this a better, newer version? I think AD is going to be fine. I think the biggest problem with AD was um, that that irregular offseason last year. That was the biggest problem with with, with him and Brian, to be mm-hmm. honest. Like, uh, it's professional athletes, bro. Creatures of habit. I've been around too many of them for too long. They The, the routine has to stay the same or it just goes out of whack. It goes out of whack physically. It goes out of whack mentally across the board. So now you give AD a real off season, right? Where he actually works out, comes in. That's the big thing. Yeah, <laughs> it comes in with a trainer that helps his helps his health. Exactly, exactly. And and right now we should be getting back to this. Should be considered a normal season, as close at, as close as possible. So when I look at the team. What are the pros? What are the cons? The pro is, to me, he's one of the greatest pros ever with a team. Basketball IQ. Mm-hmm. You got basketball geniuses up and down the bench. Even, even the younger players definitely got some basketball thinkers, right? What's the con? If they could get to the playoffs healthy. Um, at chemistry. a certain age. Chemistry. I, I, think the, I think chemistry will work itself out. It won't. Work yourself out till probably a couple of weeks before the All Star break. I don't see them front running, front running at all. Coming in as a four or five seed and then just tearing through really? the playoffs. Absolutely, because I, I, I believe that there's going to be so much care taken to rest all of them that sometimes they're gonna they're gonna go through stretches where they're gonna lose games. They're gonna lose games because. The younger cats are gonna be taking the the the, the payload, mm-hmm. and they're not a great team as they are. But see, <clears throat> I don't think chemistry is gonna be an issue because all these guys have known each other a long time, and they all like each other, and they know basketball. Other than Westbrook and, and Rondo, there was there was some beef there. Yeah, but yeah, I think that yeah. could be worked out for sure. But overall, like I don't think chemistry is an issue. I I, I think they're gonna hit stride after the trade deadline and they're probably going to propel themselves to a two seed. I don't mm. see, I, I really do. I, I could even see him being the top seed in the West. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, but it but it, but you hit the nail on the head when it comes down to health and it's not just the health of AD, which I mean, when he first came to the Lakers, I'm not going to lie. Every time that he hit the ground, I held my breath because I thought he was going to be down. Oh, still, down. still. I got, Brian. I, I got over that in the bubble. I didn't. But I but now I'm I was after last season I'm still shell shocked. He that. hit the ground last night. I mean, uh, the, the first night, night. and yeah. I'm like, man, listen, it stresses me out every time I see the big fella fall. <laughs> it stresses me out. But even with Bron, like Bron's health comes into play. I mean, I, there's not a. I don't think there's a smarter player in the NBA than Bron, basketball IQ. But how much of it is going to be him playing thirty five to? 38, 39 minutes a night. You know what? I think that uh, when you put a team like this together, there has to be a, con- a come to Jesus meeting. Everybody has to understand that they cannot play the same exact game that they've been playing in the other places that they've been. And even Bron and AD can't. Like, you got a lot of playmakers and ball handlers. If Bron is going to be the primary ball handler, then you're going to take other guys' strengths away. Let's say Russell Westbrook. Like Let's you don't name. want not just Russell, even even Rondo. Like even some of the young guys. But when Bron like, first got there, like he wasn't going to be the primary ball handler. That was the whole point of him coming and them having having, and that's why he liked ten, ball so yeah, much. Yeah, but it's 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 tendency, man. 
And and when, just like you said, when you have that type of, of ball IQ, when the game is on the line or when you feel like you need to, that run, you're going to grab the ball and start orchestrating. And who's going to tell them no? Nobody is. So it's kind of like, I just feel like um, Russell Westbrook can be a, 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 a serious plus or it could be a waste. So I think that they really have to put the ball in his hands for bigger portions of the game and let him be Russ. I think Russ needs to be more aggressive. Because that's something that's that he Russ. was that he wasn't before. Like he he literally he literally was passive last in, in the opening night in the last game. He was he wasn't as I don't know. It just it, it just seemed like he was a different. Like he was trying to fit in. It was the first game, bro. At, do, you, do you remember when Brian first got to Miami? I knew it took some time. I, I don't. I'm, I'm not saying it's not. I'm not. I'm not stressing out over it. I'm not one of those people who's having a knee jerk reaction. Like, oh, I think, and even Vogel, he's got to figure out what his rotations are going to be. He doesn't know yet. No, he doesn't. He doesn't know yet. He's got to see it happen. Um. THT is not going to be sitting on the bench. No, he's definitely not. He's, he's a legit guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a so dude. like, you know, it's a, it's, it's, I think it's a lot that they got to work out. Um, but, but they'll be fine, man. I'm not worried about him. I'm not worried about him at all. The, the, not worried about um, them as a team. If anything keeps me sleepless is, is the possibility for injury. Yeah. That that's the thing that bothers. That, that's the thing that worries me. It derails us, man. It derails us every time, even before. A.D. Kane, when Brian hurt his growing. Um, nobody can tell me that wasn't a good team. That team was headed to the playoffs. Well, they were the number one seed. Two seed. Two seed. Yeah, that team was headed to the playoffs. Uh, you're still, they two or uh, right, four? I, no, they're two. Okay. You're still touched about uh, all the young guys leaving, huh? Trade the young guys? I'm not touched about it because we, we got another chip. I don't have to listen to nobody from Boston tell me nothing about nothing. So it, just, just for that. I'm cool. Let them go. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, that was a good that was a good squad. And if it wasn't for Bron getting hurt that year, who knows what they could have done? The best thing ever in Boston was new edition. Wait, wasn't that the wasn't that the year when uh, Durant got hurt? When when Toronto won, was that yeah. the same year? Yep. <laughs> you see the look, bro. <laughs> ain't no telling what that team could have done, man. So. <sighs> I, I'm 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 just I don't know, man. Like I I'm not worried about the Lakers. This one game, I was super hyped to see Melo get his first points as a Laker. Even Russ, I want to see Russ come out there next game and just just be Russ, you know. And and, and yeah, stop Russ is at threes. home, man. He's he's at home, and it's it's different when you when you're from the city. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he got to get out there and get his thing on. You know what's crazy is I think about the Lakers and their success and the fact that we've watched 11 titles as fans. I think about, you know, the Dodgers and the world, the three World Series that we've seen them win in our lifetime. You know, and then football teams is completely different. We're not going to get into NFL, but, like. Yeah, I know you don't want to get into the NFL. But, yeah, because you had a horrible weekend last weekend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, no, we're talking about rings right now. <laughs> but I think, I think about college football and how many we've seen USC get. Right. And I include the ring that they took they, they took because Reggie. Yeah, nobody cares about that. Yeah, he, they, he got a ring and he's still the Heisman winner. But you, but you got into soccer, and you're a huge Manchester United fan, and they're like the Yankees of, of the Premier League. The Yankees are the Manchester United. Of See what baseball. I'm saying? Like whatever, man. You know how many? How many? Say it right. Yeah, the Yankees are are the to baseball what Manchester United is to soccer, 100. percent But like, what got you into it? Like, what was the deal with that? Because I, I've never like really fully understood. Because quite frankly, I wasn't a big soccer guy until like we really started like watching it together a few years ago. Yeah. Um. Well, when I first started doing music, man. Um. I took off overseas. That's really where I spent most of my time. Um, They're writing songs for other artists, producing other artists, and, you know, performing and, and doing my own stuff. And 
it was just hard back in like the early 2000s, late 90s to watch any NFL, any NBA, anything from the U.S. Um, and even to just get the scores was a hassle because they played in like the overnight newscast where it's like three o'clock in the morning. That's where you find out what, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So and you're then, about to be just getting in from a show or and something. And then back then, man, it wasn't like, it. Was, things weren't as they are now. Like, you didn't have alerts coming into your phone constantly. And all. It used to be, used to cost so much to, like, be on your phone over there. So, you know, I just, I love sports. I've always loved sports. And the, the, they had two things on TV, was soccer and cricket. And that, that cricket-ish, bro, it wasn't for me. You didn't like it? <laughs> no, no, sir. No, sir. <laughs> But, I mean, I would always keep my TV on overnight so that I could hear the scores when they come on. And, man, I would just always hear Ryan Giggs, Ryan Giggs, Ryan Giggs, Manchester United, Manchester United. So I just started watching the game. They was like, you know, they was um, there's a popular, one of the most popular teams over there at the time. And I just started watching those games, man. And, you know, when we was kids, everybody kicked the ball around. Like it was soccer leagues all over the place when we was kids. And then nah, in, in, in my neighborhood, it was like at the park, all the Latinos every Sunday oh, yeah. would just be full of <laughs> just full of them playing, playing yeah. soccer. You know what I'm saying? Like a league or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it ain't like I had never heard of it or had never seen it before. Um, but man, when when I finally got a chance to go to a game. This girl that I was dating, her best friend, um, was dating one of the players on the team, and I got a chance to go see them play against Arsenal. But it was at Arsenal Stadium in London. And, man, <clears throat> I was hooked for life from that point. I mean. What, what, made, you, what made you hooked for life? Because, like, I mean, well, when you go to an NFL game or NBA game or a baseball game or college football game, college football in particular, the fans are more hype and they're, they're, they're really into it. But, yeah. like, I, I – like, what was the, the draw? Like, what were the fans doing that made you say, yeah, like, this is it? Well, like, you, first of all, you just, like, park in some neighborhood, and it's just thousands of people just walking through the neighborhood. Like Green Bay? To the stadium, just like that. Or just like the stadium walk for the Raiders. That's what it reminds me of. But there are literally houses. Like, the stadiums just pop up in the middle of a neighborhood, so you just park wherever, and people are just partying and drinking and like on the, wherever the main drag, the main street is going into the stadium, it's always going to be tons of pubs. And they just bars that just pack full of people ready to watch the game. And like just the, the yo, they be singing these songs. They be singing these songs about the other. They find out stuff about the other teams, like about the, the mom, the wife, whoever, and just make up a song about it. And it's terrible, like the worst. <laughs> and so you just imagine like 60,000 people singing this song about your wife <laughs> why you why you out trying to kick a ball around man like it it you know i got hooked on it so i'm up every saturday or sunday morning before our sports come on whether it's four o'clock in the morning six o'clock in the morning i'm not missing a manchester united game um i've been supporting them since what 1998 Damn. and it's 2021 and i've seen the ups I've seen the downs. And right now, honestly, I, I look at them the same way as I look at the Lakers. How they, so? They got a hell of a team. If you look on paper at the names. Ronaldo. Like a lot of these names are going to go down in history as some All of the good. best that ever did it. But they're not a team yet. They're not a team yet. They got to figure out how to play together. And in, in, in football, you recognize teams by passing efficiency. Okay. How well do you know the tendencies of the other players on the team, where they're going to be on the pitch, the angles that you kick the ball? And a lot of times we just not, we're not in tune with each other. Um, and I've seen when it used to work like damn EA Sports <laughs> back in the day <laughs> when, it, when it was like Giggs and Skulls and Beckham and Rio, Vidic, all these dudes, man, they played together like a machine. Like remember Showtime Lakers, man. A you machine. got a machine like they, the, the Golden State Warriors, a machine. They got a dude who's I think has the best name in all of pro sports. Can what's you guess that? who it is? What's the best name? Yeah, it's the best name in all of pro sports. Especially oh. if you're Latino or Latina, you you'll, you'll know exactly what I mean. Oh, 
Sancho. <laughs> 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 I'm your yo, Sancho. Man. <laughs> yo, man. Yeah, you crazy. Yo, he's got to do his thing. Like he's he's um he's an English kid, but with a name like Sancho. <laughs> yeah, he's I thought English he was kid. from like like Spain or something. Nah, he's an English kid, but he played oh, ball in uh in Germany, and he's been balling there for years, and he plays for the English national team, and now he's playing for for United. But he ain't really broke through yet. He ain't he ain't did much yet. But um, he's talented, so we'll see. So you, you talk about like he played for Germany in, in English national team and broke through. How come soccer hasn't broken through in America? Like, I mean, I could tell you growing up for me, like where I grew up across the fence was Upland junior high. Mm-hmm. So I'm with you every Sunday. It was the Mexican soccer league taking place right, right there. Yeah. Um, but as a kid, like it was either baseball, football, basketball, Right. There was no soccer. My grandfather had, a, he talked about soccer like it was the lowest form on earth. So I never, I remember, <laughs> I remember I was eight years old and I literally said, hey, can I go play ASO soccer with, you know, you ain't playing that sport. You, you're not going to use the ball. You just kick a ball around. Nope. Football's here. You go play football. I okay. Mean, you know, like, I, I just think Americans, um, well, let's say white Americans and black Americans, I'm not going to say Latino Americans or Hispanic Americans, but um, I just think that we're more inundated with the other sports because of TV. Um, How one so? One thing I mean, about the so- one thing about one thing about soccer is this: you got to go forty five minutes without cutting to commercial, and up until lately, that's not necessarily a good TV product when it comes down when TV is about advertisement. Forty five minutes straight without seeing a Colgate or Coca-Cola or whatever commercial that's unheard of on American TV. So that's why it's, it's late coming to the party. But now there's such clever ways to advertise. And then with the advent of all of the, the, the streaming sources and everything else, it's a whole lot bigger than I ever thought it was going to be here. Um, like if you at the during the summer, a lot of the bigger teams, the Barcelona's and Real Madrid's Manchester United, um, they play games in the U.S. in some of our biggest stadiums. I cannot wait for them to come to and Vegas. They are packed. They are absolutely ramshackle. It's like the 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 tickets go on sale and they like gone in five ten. Well, minutes. that was Concacaf this last at Allegiant Stadium a few yeah. months ago. They the tickets sold out in like twelve minutes. Yeah, but I mean that's that's USA versus Mexico. Naturally, I'm talking about club teams. Like those are national teams. But for club teams, like a team from Manchester, England, and a team from Madrid, Spain to be able to sell out, like, a, a Dallas stadium. Yeah. Like, that's unheard of. That's unheard of. So, just, just it's coming, you know what I'm saying? And and the, the the TV networks here are understanding how much of a cash cow it is. But because I can literally watch German soccer. I can watch Italian soccer. I can watch English soccer. All on my TV. But don't you think a good barometer for that is hockey because hockey is kind of similar. I mean, there you have, you have the two stoppages, but there isn't a lot of commercial time in breaking the ice or anything. And, and, and I even think to a small extent, hockey is just really taken off in the United States. Yeah. You know, it's taken a while versus the big three baseball, football, basketball. I, well, hockey has such a, a big following with our neighbors up North. You know what I'm saying? So right. I think that that it, it was, it's, it's an easier bleed. Um, we got some hockey teams here with, with some serious history. Even yeah. with the Canadian players, they they played on. It's mostly American teams in the NHL. So, you know, I think that I think that transition has been easier. Um, and I think the fact that that league is, you know, we speak the same language for the most part. Eh? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes, like we do. A lot, eh? It's a lot of broadcasting there that's in English <laughs> and here in English, whereas. You know, soccer's played all over the world, man. Like it's it's the world's game, so you know. But again, I see more than I've ever seen. So they said it wouldn't happen, but I see it happening. Have you ever performed in a, a soccer stadium? Um, I have, I have. It was uh, a couple, actually. I've never asked these. These yeah, are questions like, would this like we don't talk about this stuff ever? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, some of these, you know. You hit some of these festivals, man, and, like, 
they're so big. It's not like they just there to see me. They there to see like twenty five different artists. But right, you kind of get that huge stadium full full of people, and like it's nothing like it, bro. Nothing like it. Well, I'm glad we you know you educated me a little bit on soccer. I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. Happy to let you know anytime. And some of my TQ fans, some of my peeps overseas, they will like that part. I mean, hey, I'm a big Mason Greenwood fan. Yeah. That's my guy. Him and Paul. Look at him. Look at him. Yeah. Yeah, the boy is pulling out players, y'all. I'm converting him. Slowly but surely. Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, with that note, we're going to get up out of here. We're taking a lot of your time today. We appreciate you jumping on the Franchise Show podcast with with Joe and TQ. Go to FranchiseSportsMedia.com. Check out all the articles. We have some interviews up there. We have the interview with Marcus Arroyo. You know, he's a football coach. We have Mm -hmm. one coming out that's about to drop on Saturday with UNLV Interim Athletic Director Eric Harper. We got mm-hmm. some, another big one lined up in, in the hopper. And, you know, check out the highlight films because we got a lot of highlight films of high school football, UNLV. Yeah, man, the, the, the franchise highlight reel is sick. Like, Go to the media page, www.franchisesportsmedia.com slash media, and you can watch all of our original content, man. All of the interviews, all of the highlight reels, like we go out to the high school games, we hit the UNLV games, the Raider games, all of the games, and Trisha Lacoste makes her own brand of a highlight reel, and it's the extra goat. funky. You know what I'm saying? It's not the old run-of-the-mill evening sports cast version. No. Check us out, www.franchisesportsmedia.com. It's your boy, TQ. I'm Joe Arrigo. And this has been the Franchise Show on FranchiseSportsMedia.com. When the family unit is overrun, when the structure is undone, by some new concoction, now I walk softly and carry a big stick, original gorilla in the midst, get a lead, the lead, get a sis, no look dish, no bricks, I come to set the pick for the you. Roll straight to the pool. Any man come test your one thing. We're no play.